The Ukrainian military recently revealed something surprising. On August 27, 2024, the country announced the successful test firing of their first domestically home-built and produced ballistic missile. I think part of what makes this announcement kind of a big deal is that it came out around the exact same time that Ukraine's president suggested his country might be considering developing a nuclear weapon if he can't secure a NATO security guarantee against a future invasion. So follow my logic train here for just a second. I think this domestically produced ballistic missile could potentially have the capabilities necessary to carry and deliver a tactical nuclear weapon. This is something Ukraine didn't have in the past. I should also tell you that Russian President Putin responded to this development saying, quote, Russia will not allow this to happen no matter what, end quote. So as you remember, after Ukraine got rid of their Soviet-era nuclear weapons in the 1990s, they also handed over all their delivery systems, like their strategic bombers. If you're going to ever go for that nuclear deterrent, if you're going to reach for the stars, it's not enough to just develop a nuke. You also need a system that can carry the weight and fire the thing far enough away to not cook yourself in the process. And to be clear, Zelensky went on to clarify his statements that his country is not currently attempting to develop nuclear weapons, but he's also not ruling it out at this point. The point I'm trying to make is that I think all of this information is pertinent. It's something that we need to keep in the back of our noodles as we dive deeper into Ukraine's claimed new ballistic missile. The first of many questions that pop into my mind is how were they able to manufacture this in the midst of a full-scale invasion against them? How many will Kyiv be able to produce? Will they use their ballistic missiles on targets inside Russia? And how will this possibly impact the wider picture of the war, if at all? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Let's find out. First, I want to start with a brief disclaimer that there was only really one main source that I could find that was a Ukrainian source for information on this weapon. While the open source intelligence community is pouring over every detail about the new ballistic missile, there's not much capacity for independently verifying the info on a secret weapons project. What that means is I want to forewarn you that the claims here are from Ukrainian officials and they may be exaggerated, they might be mistranslated, or they could be intentionally misleading to throw off their adversaries' operational planners. Take specific capabilities with a healthy dose of salt. That said, we do know Ukraine has been working on developing their own ballistic missile system for a while now. Way back in the ancient days of 1996, they first started on a project codenamed Borisfin to replace their Soviet-era Tochka-U ballistic missiles. Ukraine inherited about 500 of the Tochka missiles after the fall of the Soviet Union, and Ukraine wanted a newer system to expand on that 120-kilometer max range of the old missiles along with the industrial benefits of developing their own domestic arms industry. Based on the capabilities of the last system, we can kind of fill in the blanks a little bit and guesstimate what the new system will be able to do. So the Tochka U fired and operated similar to how the Russian Iskandir launcher does. Its main high explosive warhead for the missile was pretty huge at 420 kilograms or 930 pounds. It's like a thousand pounds worth of explosives. That's like twice the boom of an attack a missile, but the problem is the accuracy. Because the Tochka U has a circular error probable of hitting within 95 meters of the intended target. To be even more specific, it means 50% of the time you're hitting within that area. So yes, that means 50% of the time it works every time. If you're aiming at a giant base, that might not be too bad, but nowadays we expect higher levels of precision. This is a hint as to what might be upgraded here with the new system. For context, HIMARS rockets have a circular error probable about 10 meters. So what do we know about this new system? And how was its development marred in political intrigue? But before we get into that, I want to tell you about how Armasite went full sicko mode with their new Sidekick 640 thermal monocular device. The reason why I love the Sidekick 640 is because it's lightweight, weighing under 250 grams or about half a pound. Personally, I like to use it helmet mounted, but it's also perfect for handheld use. 
It gave me crazy visual clarity. Thanks to the Armasite's Iron Wolf technology, it really cleared everything up. What that means is that it has a fast 60 hertz frame rate. Whether I was testing it in motion or at rest, the images rendered were freaking crystal clear. I found it useful for surveillance around my place, but I could also see it being awesome for search and rescue or room clearing operations. I was even able to see through smoky, visually obstructed environments with it. Head over to Armasite.com or click the link below to check out the Sidekick 6 40 for yourself and all of the awesome Armasite gear that is sure to revolutionize your outdoor experience. Pivdenya Design Bureau in the city of Dnipro started development of the Boris Fin, which would have had a 100 kilometer and 500 kilometer range versions. Chronic funding issues and perceived lack of need for such an advanced weapon delayed work on the project until it was canceled by then Prime Minister Viktor Yanukovych in 2003. Just three years later, newly elected President Yushchenko revisited the idea of a ballistic missile in 2006 with a new, more modern scope. But it was done under the new name Sapsin, which is Ukrainian for Peregrine Falcon. The fresh project would be versatile, multifunctional missile capable of engaging land, air, or sea targets up to 500 kilometers away. This wasn't as pie in the sky as it first sounds. The Pivdeni Design Bureau had a strong missile pedigree, working on 12 out of the 20 different intercontinental ballistic missiles used by the Soviet Union over the course of the Cold War. 60 different domestic companies with relevant experience would contribute to the Sapsin project, building everything within Ukraine, from rocket motors and the launch vehicle to radar and guidance electronics. But despite an initial budget request of $400 million for the project, the cash-strapped country could only afford around $25 to $40 million, and development of the Sapsin floundered around for the next seven years. Still, the project soldiered on, with lots of design elements borrowed from the Russian Iskandir ballistic missile, and a prototype was ready by 2011. Keep in mind, when we talk about the Iskandir, according to the U.S. Army Tradoc, it is able to fire nuclear warheads. The Iskandir, for reference, has a circular error probable of hitting within about 30 to 70 meters of where you aim. However, I've seen some other sources that claim that there are missile variants that can hit within 5 meters. So, actual serial production of the missile at scale would have cost significantly more money than Ukraine had at the time though, especially while the country was still reeling from the effects of the 2008 global financial crisis. To breathe new life into the project and attract foreign capital to boost Ukraine's arms industry, an export version of the Sapsin called the Harem went into development. And hopefully I'm pronouncing Herm correctly so I don't get absolutely roasted in the comments. The Herm 2, sometimes called Grom in the marketing materials, had the same overall capabilities as the Sapsin, but with a reduced range of 280 kilometers to comply with that good old fashioned MTCR International Arms Treaty. Saudi Arabia was thoroughly impressed by the Herm 2, which offered similar performance and features to Russia's Iskandir, but at a much lower price point. That stuff is flying off the shelves. It's bargain Tuesday on Ukrainian missiles out here. But why build a ballistic missile in the first place? What capabilities might this new system have? And how will it affect the battlefield going forward? To give more context on this, here's Diego Asituno, one of our researchers, as well as a former Coast Guard gunner's mate. Ukraine has already been using drones and cruise missiles to great effect since the start of the war, both foreign and domestically produced ones. But a proper ballistic missile adds a few key capabilities that these other long-range strike platforms just don't have. For one, it comes down from a very high angle, basically from space, and it travels just stupidly fast while it does so, above Mach 7 or 5,300 miles per hour. Add in a little bit of maneuvering capacity, and ballistic missiles are much tougher targets to shoot down than something that flies horizontally at subsonic or low supersonic speeds like those other platforms do. It's not impossible to shoot one down, but it takes a very sophisticated combination of radar system, command network, and high altitude interceptor missile to be able to do it. Things that Russia has already demonstrated some problems with, as the S-400 system they've deployed to Crimea to stop Atakums missiles keeps getting hit by Atakums missiles. If the Sapsan, or whatever they end up calling this thing, can reach the 500 kilometer range they want, that's 200 kilometers further than the Atakums missile they've been using, which places a lot more Russian air bases, command centers, and supply depots under threat. Further Russian logistics get pushed back from the front, the worse it gets at delivering ammunition, fuel, or even food to Russian troops. 
And SAPSAN doesn't come with any external restrictions about how Ukraine can choose to use it like other platforms. It only takes six minutes for a short range ballistic missile to reach 500 kilometers. So if Ukraine sees a formation of Russian troops gathering around across the border, they can have warheads on their foreheads within minutes without having to ask Washington for permission first. So even if they only produce a few of these missiles a month, that's a very limited quantity, the fact Ukraine has a free hand to use this weapon however they see fit could dramatically change Russia's behavior at the tactical and strategic levels. The planned export version packs a 500 kilogram high explosive warhead, GPS and inertial navigation systems, terrain mapping and radar for terminal guidance, and the option to mount cluster warheads for a larger area of effect. Saudi Arabia placed an order for the Herm 2 from Ukraine and production started in December 2016, but by 2019 only two launchers and 19 rocket motors were produced and the current status of the orders isn't publicly known. But Ukraine's own ballistic missile venture hit even more snags. In 2013, then Defense Minister of Ukraine Pavlo Lebedev halted all funding for the Sapsin project, supposedly due to lackluster capabilities. Yet this may have actually been an act of sabotage by Russia. Lebedev held dual citizenship with the Russian Federation and conveniently found himself in Crimea right after being fired from his position in the defense ministry, but also right before the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014. In fact, he was in a meeting with Putin in the Kremlin on the day of annexation and has since gone to lead the Crimean branch of the RU, the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs. Ukrainian cabinet minister Oleksandr Sayenko believes Lebedev's cancellation of this Sapsin missile program just before Russia's invasion of Crimea is no coincidence. Quote, Russia was preparing for war with Ukraine and tried to undermine our progress by any means. Sabotage or not, the annexation of Crimea and the ongoing war in the Donbass seriously put a damper on what little funding was left for the Sapsan project. New, more urgent priorities meant Ukraine's defense industry was doing all it could just to maintain their territorial integrity. Their design bureau managed to adapt some of the knowledge and techniques they'd gained from making the Herm 2 missile for Saudi Arabia, but a functional 500 kilometer range missile was still a long way away. A 2021 estimate by Errol Kral, the head of Western Ukraine's defense industrial complex, put the Sapsin program at only 70% complete. Work on the project was even further delayed the next year with the launch of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. It was all hands on deck to repel the initial invasion, and no one knew at the time how the battle for Kyiv would play out. Long-term research and development projects like the Saps and Harem 2 missiles took a backseat to just keeping Russian tanks as far away from the capital as possible. The issue of only having old Soviet Tachka U missiles first identified as a potential problem way back in the 1990s, had now transformed into a very real nightmare. Not only were the Tachkas outdated, but many were so old that their rocket fuel had gone bad. Of the original 500 missiles, Ukraine had only 90 left in any kind of real operational status by the start of the 2022 invasion. The Ukrainian army had to conserve their limited supply for only the highest priority missions. And even then, their short 120 kilometer range was far outstretched by the 500 kilometer Iskandir M that the Russian military was lobbing at them. The lack of indigenous domestically produced long range weapons was such a problem that some Ukrainians have said that Russia might not even have invaded in the first place if the Sapsin had been developed and delivered on schedule. Quote, it's unfortunate that we haven't come up with it sooner if Ukraine had a sufficient number of Harem 2 Sapsin operational tactical missile systems, we're not sure if Russia would have dared to occupy Crimea or other territories. End quote from Yuri Hinat, the spokesperson for the Ukrainian Air Force. As the full-scale invasion unfolded and Ukraine managed to hold the line, the war morphed into the more steady state that we see today, where large advances by either side come at a high cost. Maneuver warfare was out for a period of time and artillery was in. While that's a bit of an oversimplification, the truth remains that Russia has the advantage in a war of attrition. They have more men, more equipment, more artillery, and more ammunition to throw at any sector until just sheer weight forces Ukrainian troops to fall back. Western deliveries of arms and ammunition has helped, especially the HIMARS launch platform and attack ammunitions that could hit Russian airfields and supply depots. 
Attackums can reach out to 165 kilometers. Updated versions can reach 300 kilometers. That was delivered in secret to Ukraine in March of 2024, but these weapons arrived in small numbers and came with preconditions. Anything that was targeted using these or other long range Western weapons had to be approved by the United States before Ukraine could fire it. Ukraine has had great difficulty striking targets more than 100 kilometers from the front. For their part, Russia has capitalized on this capability gap by keeping large supply depots at a safe distance, while amassing forces or launching their own long-range weapons from within their borders where they can't be hit back. But in the background, it seems that Ukraine has been quietly continuing their own ballistic missile program. Several interviews over the years with Ukrainian military officers and defense industrialists confirmed the Sapsan and Harem 2 projects were still in the works, but slow progress still plagued the program. In June 2023, an interview with Ihor Kroll poured cold water on excitement that the missile would almost be ready, estimating they were only about 70% of the way to a functional prototype, nowhere near serial production stage yet. There's some conflicting reports about how far along the Herm 2 missile is, considering it supposedly entered production for Saudi Arabia back in 2016, so it could be that either these first reports in 2016 were overstating progress, or the process was put on hold when it became clear that Russia's invasion was going to happen. So is the mystery missile from the August 27th announcement the Sapsen missile that's finally seeing the light of day? The most prominent theory among defense analysts is that the new missile is the culmination of the Sapsen project. Ukraine may have simply had a breakthrough in recent months, or were further along with development in 2023 than they were willing to publicly disclose. The head of Russian-occupied Crimea even claimed to have shot down a Herm-2 ballistic missile in May 2023. But there's very little evidence that that was actually a Herm-2 missile, and that claim is heavily disputed even within Russian circles. Still, some explosions at Russian air bases and ammo depots, suspiciously far behind the front lines, had Western analysts wondering if Ukraine may have been testing their ballistic missiles as early as August 2022. According to Ukrainian military news outlet Defense Express, it makes the most sense for Ukraine to actually conduct its tests on Russian targets. Quote, it's difficult to say whether we have a range today where we would have the opportunity to covertly conduct tests of this type of missile. It is unlikely that our Western partners also have ranges at which they would allow us to test ballistic missiles. Perhaps the test of our ballistic missile took place not at the range, but in real combat conditions. Maybe the test took place immediately on the invaders. End quote. Russia may have provided help in other ways too. As crazy as it might sound, Russia's constant barrage of missiles and drones of various types over the years might have given Ukrainian engineers the extra 10% of information that they needed to finish their design. By the end of 2023, Russia had launched over 7,400 missiles at Ukraine, and that leaves a lot of debris or dud warheads lying around. Even if most of the components are charred wreckage, eventually you find enough in good condition to piece the original design back together. Add to that some collaboration with Western countries, and it's not hard to see how Ukraine's long-running missile program could have been a sudden burst of inspiration. So I want to reiterate, there's no silver bullet weapon system for Ukraine to develop here that's going to change the course of the war. But it will be interesting to see how Ukraine uses this new capability. I want to know what you guys think of it down in the comments section below. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, signing off this net now. Check out this video here if you want to watch another.